Welcome to the Explores. Time traveling through history, one era at a time. I'm Kate Armstrong. Last time, we spent a few years in the middle of the Roman Republic, hanging out with the stellar woman who was Cornelia Africana. Now we travel forward some 100 years to a very fateful time in Roman history, 44 BCE. This is the year Julius Caesar is assassinated and Rome starts its shift from a republic to an empire. If you like ancient Rome, you'll probably know the stories of the men we're going to touch on. But what of the women who married them, inspired them, challenged and changed them? We are going to explore this year, and the ones before and after it, through the eyes of two Roman domine. Wives, mistresses, behind-the-scenes influencers, even gang leaders. These ladies had important parts to play in shaping history during one of Rome's most violent, wild, and tumultuous times. Strap your fanciest stola over your sharpest dagger. Let's go traveling. But first, a shout out to some of my patrons. My pirate queens, Becky, Chloe, Emily, Erin, Jackie, Jessica B, Kara, Kayla, Lauren O, Lydia, Marie Claire, Mira, Mikkel, Morgan, Samantha, Sarah, Sean, Stephanie, and Wendy. And my lady presidents, Alexis, Amanda H, Amanda P, Amy, Brendan, Audrey, Belinda, Caroline, Cassie, Catherine, Krista, Claire, Courtney, Courtney H, Crystal, Dana, Debbie, Diana, Edie, Elizabeth M, Elizabeth G, Ellie, Elspeth, Emily, Eve, Iris, Jeanette, Jessica S, Caitlin, Karen R, Casey, Kat, Kelly, Kelly F, Kim, Larissa, Lauren K, Lori, Louisa, Manda, Mary, Meg, Melissa, Nancy, Nicole, Pamela, Paul, Sasha, Townsend, and Veronica. And to the Imperators and Augustas who give me more each month than I ask for. Avery, Karen C., and Jackie C. Becoming a patron really helps me keep the show going, and it gives you exclusive access to bonus episodes, sneak peeks, trailers, polls, prizes, and more. To find out all about it, just go to my website. And now, to Ancient Rome. Before we truly get into it, let's get some context for what's changed in Rome since Cornelia's time. Because by 44 BCE, the Roman Republic she knew is in serious peril. In fact, it's been in peril for quite a while, despite the fact that Rome is turning into a bit of a military juggernaut. If ancient Rome was some kind of bathroom mold infestation, it's the kind that not even industrial bleach can get out. They control most of what the Mediterranean touches and show little signs of slowing down. But along with all that expansion has come a slow and general breakdown in our system of checks and balances, allowing ambitious men to take more than their fair share. Part of the issue is that we're a culture that's centered around our military. As Rome continues to balloon outward, it becomes more and more reliant on, and kind of obsessed with, great generals. And those generals accrue more and more power and wealth. Military victories, and the spoils that come with them, make these ambitious men feel that, really, they are in a much better position to run things than any old senator picking his nose back in Rome. It doesn't help that, to reward their triumphs, the Senate often breaks its own rules. Case in point, a very successful general named Marius serves as consul an unprecedented seven times in a row. We're setting some dangerous precedents in terms of who holds power and how they get it that we won't be able to undo. 
Plus, the soldiers who fight for these generals often feel more loyal to them than they do to the Roman state. So they have money, sway, and huge armies they can inspire to march in any direction. And sometimes that direction is straight back into Rome. Take what happens in 88 BCE, when a civil war breaks out between the supporters of two different big deal generals, Marius and Sulla. All you really need to know about this complicated cluster is that after several years of internal fighting and battling between different Roman factions, Sulla does something new. He becomes the first Roman general to ever march his army past the Palmarium, the sacred boundary that surrounds the city of Rome, with the express intention of taking it by force, which he does. And suddenly, in a land that hates kings with a fiery passion, he declares himself its dictator. You know, just until he can get the place under control. This was allowed, kinda. The law said a dictator could be appointed in case of emergency, but that law had never been put to the test. In exercising his absolute power, things got ugly quickly. He instituted something called prescriptions. This is a fancy word for writing up a wanted poster with a list of your enemies and nailing it to the forum. Those who killed someone on the list and brought them to Sulla would even get a little cash money. Many heads were hung up and displayed on the rostra, in the forum, even at Sulla's house. Because nothing says interior chic quite like a severed head. Thousands died, many of them patricians, some because they were declared as enemies of the state, and some because, well, someone just wanted to off them. It was a scary, anxious time. But eventually Sulla does step down, and the Republic goes pretty much back to how it was, at least on the surface. But by letting such a thing happen once, the Senate cracked open a door for ambitious men to wriggle through. It's inspired a lot of guys to believe that they, too, can seize the reins of the Republic and ride it for all it's worth. Which is how, by 44 BCE, Rome has once again come to be run by a dictator. One who's not just for now, but for life. His name is Julius Caesar. This is a guy we'll be spending some time with, so let's peruse his OkCupid okay profile, which is, FYI, written entirely in the third person, because writing about himself by name is kind of his thing. Some people say Julius Caesar has an ego, but he thinks he just has what you'd call a big personality. And he is pretty big, in so many manly ways. Ambition, intelligence, cunning, man-tackle. His friends like to joke that he's craftier than a Bond villain, but obviously so much more virtuous and handsome. He enjoys nothing so much as war games, reciting poetry, snappy dressing, slaying the ladies, and pointed adoration of his soldiers. And wait, did he already say slaying the ladies? He's never seen a title, a foreign land, or a fine woman he didn't want to come, see, and conquer. He's a totally chill guy, as long as your team's Caesar. Just don't joke about his bald spot. Seriously. Just don't. In the years that elapse before he meets our first leading lady, his life has already been a rather drama-filled roller coaster. This rakish, calculating, headstrong man started out as a son from a noble patrician family, but had a father who managed to lose it all. And then during Sulla's dictatorship, he refused to divorce his wife when Sulla told him to, and he had to run from Rome for his life. Not the most promising of political beginnings. And yet from there, he became a soldier, proving his mettle against Mithridates in the eastern Mediterranean. But he wasn't content with that. If he is anything, Julius Caesar is ambitious. So when he returned home, he focused in on politics, turning himself into a rising star and defender of the people. He doesn't much care about rich food, and one guy will go on to say that he's perhaps the only person who ever overthrows the Roman state while sober. But his bedroom exploits are legendary. He'll go on to marry several women, sleep with a handful of queens, and maybe even a king in there somewhere. When he rides back into Rome during one of his military triumphs, this is one of the songs his soldiers will roast him with. Men of Rome, keep close to your consorts. He's a bald adulterer. But starting around 64 BCE, one woman will enter his life and remain a constant. Her name is Servilia. She's there through all the ups and downs, his troubles and triumphs, for some two decades. 
And then her son has to go and spoil everything by stabbing Julius right in the chest. But let's back up and talk about Servilia's life up to just before they meet, as it has a lot to tell us about being a patrician-born woman in the late Republic. Remember that the patricians are considered Rome's oldest and most distinguished clans, and they believe very firmly in their right to run Rome. Hers, the Servilii, is very fine indeed. She has many forebears who distinguish themselves in politics. They even claim that Romulus and Remus's mom was the Servilii. She'll have grown up with these stories, and the idea that her family is one of honor. But in Rome, honor is a thing that's given by other people, and it's something that has to be constantly earned. So it's unfortunate that her granddad is defeated by so-called barbarians in battle, leaving Rome vulnerable and humiliating his relations. It's possible that she and Julius Caesar both have a chip on their shoulder about the actions of their patriarchs. We know pretty much nothing about her childhood, shocker, except that her parents get divorced when she's quite young. While divorce is pretty common in Rome, it's not considered morally reprehensible, and legally speaking, it isn't difficult to achieve. We have to imagine it has an impact. What does she think of her mother leaving her father and marrying another man? We have no way to know. But it's through that marriage that she ends up with a half-brother named Cato the Younger and a half-sister named Portia, not to mention her full sisters as well. As the oldest, it's possible she feels she needs to take care of her siblings. That, or boss them around, and her stepbrother Cato is not an easy dude to get along with. For one, he's stubborn as hell. As kids, when a controversial politician named Quintus Popadius Silo visits the house, he asks playfully if he can have their vote. They all nod and smile, but Cato just gives him the stink eye. When he refuses to answer in the affirmative, Silo hangs Cato by the feet out the window and tries to make him go along. Even then, Cato keeps his mouth shut. This guy is as immovable as they come. And that's worth mentioning, as Cato is going to come creeping back up into Servilia's story like a particularly bad smell that no frankincense perfume can cover. That smell is probably dominated by his unwashed feet. He's a stoic, which means he thinks life should be as unfun as possible. We don't happen to have his dating profile. Cato doesn't believe in online dating, or in being online, period. But he's written us up a little scroll manifesto. My enemies call me stubborn, but I prefer to think of it as having standards. I hate nothing so much as corruption, and respect nothing so much as moral integrity. Perfume? No. Dancing? Double no! Merriment? I scorn such vices, and so should you. You brazen hussy! So, yeah, Servilia has to be pretty forceful and strong-willed to keep that guy in check. When both of their parents die in 91 BCE, she finds herself moving house once again with her siblings to live with her uncle Marcus Drusus on the Palatine, Rome's fanciest and most exclusive hill. While there, she'll be educated alongside the boys, though probably not in the ways of politics and speech-making. But those lessons can be had if she only pays attention. Her uncle is in politics, and has been for years, which means that his house is a place to eavesdrop on all sorts of interesting conversations during the morning salutatio. Her uncle Drusus is a polarizing figure with all of his for-the-people policies. He has crowds of enthusiastic followers who like his radical ideas about opening up citizenship to Italians outside of Rome, but he also makes a lot of senatorial enemies. The stakes are high, even for such a distinguished family. If his efforts succeed, they will have more influence and power than ever. But if he fails, well, he does, and he's stabbed in the forecourt of their house. On the day he bleeds to death slowly, Servilia might even be there to watch. And so, by the ripe old age of somewhere around 13, Servilia has already suffered several brutal blows. She's come to know, in quite a personal way, what happens when even a powerful patrician plays his cards unwisely. After that, we think Servilia spends the rest of her childhood living with some formidable Servilii women, probably her aunt and grandmother. In her family, the men tend to die violently, but the women serve as constant guideposts. If only we could be flies on the wall beside their dinner couches, soaking up the conversation and lessons these women have to teach her about how a woman should navigate their fast-changing world. A 
Eventually, she does what all Roman ladies are supposed to do and gets married. In this section of her story, we see how complex life can be for a woman like her. One of the most important values for a Roman man to strive for is virtus or virtue, which is tied up in ideas about manliness, courage, and general worth. Women have an equivalent, but how they strive for it looks very different. Men are made illustrious by consulships. Seneca tells us, Eloquence raises them to immortal fame. Military glory and triumph over a new tribe hallow them. The peculiar virtue of women is pudicitia. We've talked about this virtue before. It means chastity. But it isn't just about being sexually chaste. It's about moral purity. About always striving for loyalty, courage, and fidelity. As a woman, she has a narrow but important range of responsibilities. Get married, have children, and raise them well. She must always be a credit to her family. But in this period, we see women wielding more and more influence in realms they aren't otherwise supposed to be. Because she's got money and status, Servilia also has opportunities to move in highly influential circles, have dinners where she lounges next to influential men. If she has a mind to, she might be able to whisper an idea in a politician's ear, to drop hints and plant seeds that might just influence the shape the Republic is taking. And while while we can only really guess at Servilia's personality, we get the impression that she's strong, determined, smart, and very savvy. To survive the wild ride her life is going to take, she has to be. Her first husband is a guy named Marcus Brutus, who is about twice her age, and around the age of 15, she bears him a son. That's fine. Does she love her husband? With both her parents and her uncle dead, it's fair to say that she's somewhat independent under the law and may have a healthy hand in choosing him, so maybe. Though the Romans admire love in a marriage, we don't have any indication that she chose him because of it. It's just as likely that she sees him as someone who's going places that she wants to go as well. He becomes a tribune, but when the dictator Sulla comes on the scene and changes the rules of Rome's constitution, he finds that he's ineligible to run for office again. This pisses him right off, so he joins a rebellion against Sulla. In the ensuing struggle, he's killed by a guy named Pompey. Earmark that name for later. Given that he leaves Servilia a widow, she loathes Pompey, and she brings her son Brutus up to loathe him too. But she shrugs off her rage and her sadness, and unlike Cornelia, she marries again, this time to a man named Decimus. This time around, she probably does get to pick him for herself. I get the feeling that Servilia likes cunning and political acumen in a man, and in this way, husband too ends up being disappointing. He comes from quite a good patrician family, but when he runs for the consulship, Cicero tells us that he lacked both friends and repute. Ooh, burn, Cicero. Later, he only gets another consulship by bribing people, a more and more common practice in the eroding Republican system. Even then, he doesn't make much of an impact. Though he does give Servilia several daughters, he doesn't give her what I think she truly craves the chance to splash around in Rome's most powerful waters. He dies somewhere around 62 BCE, and once again, Servilia's like, I am on the prowl. And so it is our lovers meet. We don't know how exactly, but I like to imagine them both at the same dinner party, making eyes over platters of dormice as they engage in witty repartee. He is, unfortunately, already married. When they hook up, it might be that she's also still married. But that doesn't stop those sparks from flying. And why not? Caesar is a man on the rise, charming, ambitious, smart, full of energy. In him, I think she sees her match. He also happens to be her age. That's refreshing, and by all accounts, pretty sexy. She must like what she sees, and so must he, because their steamy affair is going to go on for decades. Most historians paint her as the love of his life. There are plenty of factors that suggest this is way more than just a sexy tryst. First, there's the fact that it lasts for so long. 
Caesar, as we've already noted, is quite fond of the ladies, but typically his loves don't last for long. That he continues to be tied to her in the record suggests that their bond is about more than really good horizontal tennis. There's also the fact that she seems willing to face down the potential ramifications of the affair. Remember what we learned about the rules of such things in episode 16. Namely, that patrician men can sleep with whoever they like so long as they're single, of lower status, and unmarried. But Servilia is most certainly not of lower status, and if their affair starts in 64 BCE, as some some sources claim, and it's true that her husband doesn't die until 62, then she's also married. In the eyes of the Romans, that makes their union pretty scandalous. And there's also the fact that Julius Caesar divorces his second wife, Pompeia, in 63, which we'll talk about when we get to our next leading lady. You'd think that would clear the way for Julius and Servilia to get hitched, so why don't they? I have to say, this one has me scratching my head. Perhaps Caesar wants to keep his options open. In Rome, one of the very best ways to cement alliances is to marry someone's sister or daughter, tying two families together. Servilia doesn't have any male relationships he wants to get into political bed with, but she is clearly influential and very savvy. Hey Caesar, any thoughts? Look, Caesar loves a headstrong, smart, opinionated woman. In bed, but he prefers his wives subservient and sweet, and he's not really sorry about it. Oh, uh, Julius. Maybe Servilia doesn't want to marry him. Being his sexy friend with benefits gives her power and influence without her having to be subservient to him. Maybe she feels like she can influence and enjoy him more as a lover. But really, your guess is as good as mine. It must be said that their honeymoon period ends pretty early. In 60 BCE, Julius joins up with two other ambitious gentlemen in an unofficial arrangement called the First Triumvirate. This is the name we've given it in our time. Back when they first struck it up, it was called Tricoranus, or the Three-Headed Monster. That name sums up the kind of danger some thought this alliance posed to the Republic. All three of these guys want things they can't get on their own, and between them, they're hoping they'll be able to essentially run the show in Rome. Kind of a you-scratch-my-back-I'll-scratch-yours situation. There's Crassus, who we'll call the money. He's rich as they come and just as devious. There's Julius, of course, who we'll call the brain. And then there's Pompey, who we'll call the brawn. He is one of Rome's most famous military generals and, you'll remember, one of Servilia's sworn enemies. She can't be super thrilled with this arrangement. We can only imagine the fight Servilia might have with Julius over this particular power play. If we envision her as opinionated and proud, which I do, she can't like seeing her lover and her enemy joining forces. But I also get the impression that Servilia is someone who doesn't let her emotions get the best of her. She knows how to be calculating, and she understands political cunning. That's led some historians to label her as ruthless, desiring power at any cost. I think it just shows she's savvy about the circles she swims in. As we'll find out before long, women who let their emotions show, if those emotions fall outside of the range of a good Roman woman, they don't seem to get far. Perhaps Julius tells her that, with their backing, he's going to go from rising star to Roman champion. And he's right. With their help, Julius quickly climbs up the political ladder. So much so that by 59 BCE, he's buying Servilia some lavish presents. Above all others, Caesar loved Servilia, Suetonius tells us. And in his first consulship, he bought for her a pearl costing six million sesterces. It's hard to translate what that would equate to in modern dollars, but we're talking the equivalent of a harbor's worth of very expensive yachts. This is, by the way, the year he's marrying another woman named Calpurnia. Talk about some emotional whiplash. It's also the year he has Servilia's half-brother Cato forcibly removed from the rostra for speaking against an agrarian law he's pushing into play. Cato and his smelly feet have been working tirelessly to dismantle and otherwise ruin the triumvirate, which he sees as a giant threat to the sanctity and health of the Republic. Cato may be a bore, but he isn't wrong. So he and Caesar loathe each other, which has got to be awkward for Servilia. Or maybe she finds Cato as boring as her lover does. Plutarch tells us that during a tense debate in the Senate, someone brings Caesar a note. Cato demands to read it aloud. What is the meaning of this? I demand you turn it over so that the Senate may be privy to any treachery. So Julius hands it right over. Sure, man. 
Why not? In fact, why don't you read it out loud? You have such a great reading voice. And Cato starts to read, only to find himself airing a steamy love letter from Servilia. My dearest Julie Pooh, my loins flow like an aqueduct when I think of your sweet, sweet... Uh. Awkward. The affair most certainly isn't a secret, and you'd think it would dent Servilia's reputation. After all, women aren't supposed to sleep around, at least not openly. And yet their relationship doesn't seem to hurt her. Instead, it gives her new contacts and influence, which suggests she's smart and well-connected. She isn't one to parade the relationship around or overtly try and influence her lover's politics. Instead, she goes gently, with a deft touch, making friends and smoothing over any troubles. Caesar clearly isn't the only man who respects Servilia, and she has her own friends in high places. Of course I do. I am incredibly fabulous. But the bigger he gets, the more debts Julius accrues from all the bribes he's paying to climb the power ladder, and eventually, he has to sneak out of Rome under cover of darkness to go find ways of paying them off. We don't know how much, if any, Servilia participates in his schemes and what she thinks of his tactics while he's away. But we have to imagine they exchange letters when he marches off for several years on a wildly successful military campaign through Gaul, where he ruthlessly subdues what most consider an unconquerable people, cementing himself as one of Rome's most brilliant generals ever. I can imagine her doing the equivalent of cutting out news clippings and pasting them into a little scrapbook. We can imagine her breathless anguish in 51 BCE when Pompey, now at the head of the Senate, orders Caesar to return to Rome unarmed and face the music for starting that war in Gaul without Senate approval. How she must cheer, or maybe not, when he marches his troops into Rome across the river Rubicon, igniting a bloody civil war between the members of the First Triumvirate, from which he ultimately rises victorious. Who knows what she feels when he sails off to Egypt, where he helps Queen Cleopatra secure her throne and has a steamy affair in the process. All we can do is wonder, as no one's found Servilia's super-secret diary. But I imagine if we asked her, she might say, Please, I'm too busy going to the baths and influencing politics to worry about what Julius is doing. No doubt their affair ebbs and flows during this time, on and off again during his absences. And we can hope that Savvy Servilia has other relationships and hobbies besides Team Caesar. I get the feeling she's not one to sit around and pine. Plus, she's got a son to raise, remember? But it seems they stay devoted to each other, at least in friendship. Julius continues to give her gifts to show his favor. It's interesting to note that while Caesar sends back cash to guys like Cicero and others seeking political office to help with their expenses, thinking they'll be a wise pro-Caesar investment, he also sends gifts back to their wives. Why do that if these women have no sway with their husbands and have no chance of making an impact? But of course, Servilia gets some of the best gifts of all. Suetonius says that, During the Civil War, he acquired some fine estates for her in a public auction at a nominal price. And when some expressed their surprise at the low figure, Cicero quipped, It's a better bargain than you think, for he got a third off. This little remark is supposed to suggest that he's been sleeping with Servilia's daughter. The word third in Latin is Tertia, which also happens to be very close to that daughter's name. Cicero suggests that, when Servilia starts to feel like Julius is losing interest, she pimps out her own daughter to sweeten the deal. Sometimes Cicero is catty as hell. There's also a rumor that Caesar is young Marcus Brutus's true father. Plutarch wrote that he treated Brutus with special attention. Out of tenderness to Servilia, the mother of Brutus, for Caesar had, it seems, in his youth had been very intimate with her, and she passionately in love with him. And considering that Brutus was born about that time in which their loves were at the highest, Caesar had a belief that he was his own child. Caesar would have been maybe 15 when Brutus was born, so unlikely. But it goes to show how much he cares for Servilia. He certainly seems to have stepped into Brutus's life as a sort of father figure. But things get messy during that civil war that pits the three triumvirs against each other. Suddenly, though not for the first time, Rome is forced to choose sides in a very bloody squabble over the Republic's future. 
Servilia finds her family in turmoil. She, obviously, is Team Caesar. Her half-brother Cato is staunchly anti-Caesar and picks up his sword to march against him. Oh, Cato. And Brutus, her only son, her legacy, the boy she has pinned all her hopes on, decides to side with Pompey. Pompey, who is not only Caesar's rival, but Servilia's enemy and Brutus's father's murderer. We don't know how she feels about it, but I'm voting for a mixture of anger, worry, and betrayal. Ugh, men. But when Caesar defeats Pompey's forces at Pharsalus, he puts out an order to make sure that Brutus is to go unhurt and unpunished. This could be because he likes the kid, but it's also got to be out of love for Servilia. He isn't about to execute her only son, which, it turns out, is a big mistake. By 45 BCE, not all is well between son and mother. Servilia grows angry with Brutus for unexpectedly divorcing his wife, Claudia Polcra, so he can marry his cousin, Cato's daughter Portia. Rude, Brutus! Is this because she remembers her own parents' divorce and doesn't think he's being fair to Claudia? Or is it because she sees herself as his patriarch of a sort and doesn't like her son going against her plans? The ancient sources would have us believe that Servilia and this new wife do not get on. She worries about how much influence this new bride might have on her son, that Portia might take her place in her son's affections. At least Brutus stays high in Caesar's estimation. In 44 BCE, he promotes young Brutus to a praetorship. Little does he or Servilia know that her son will end up at the heart of the plot to kill the man she spent so many of her nights with. And so we're back in 44 BCE, and in some people's eyes, Julius Caesar is a hero. During his time as a general, he claimed to have killed almost 2 million people and won 50 battles. As a political leader, he's given grain to the poor and made sure his soldiers had land as reward for their services. As dictator, he's building libraries, reforming Rome's calendar, creating jobs, kissing babies. He's also balding, but seriously, don't say anything about that. In general, the public seems to love him, but there are members of the senatorial elite who are getting really worried about what they see as his king-like powers. They don't like that he's a dictator, a position that consuls are only supposed to appoint in military emergencies and then only for six months. They don't like that he doesn't really listen. And when he's named dictator for life in February of 44, they know they've got a serious problem. It looks like he's not going to step down from his position, not unless someone pries it from his cold, dead hands. That same month, Caesar's loyal second, Mark Antony, tries to put a laurel crown on his head in public, a sign of kingship. He refuses it, saying that only the god Jupiter is the king of the Romans. But a lot of people doubt he's sincere. They think he may even have planned the whole thing, either to reassure the people or give them a little inspiration. Also, he's just done something pretty racy for his girlfriend, Cleopatra. She's in Rome as we speak, residing in one of Julius's villas just outside of town. Can we talk about this for a minute? He's got a famous, very smart and savvy queen in one villa, his actual wife in another, and maybe Servilia in another, probably trying not to roll her eyes about the whole hot mess. That is a lot of lover juggling, but I wonder if at this point he and Servilia are mostly affectionate friends. We'll talk more about Julius and Cleo in a few episodes' time, looking at it all through her eyes. Yes, queen! But for now, here's what you need to know. Cleopatra has come to town with Caesar's son in tow, his only son, even if he is illegitimate. To make this worse, he's just had a statue of her cast entirely in gold, which he's placed in a temple alongside a statue of the goddess Venus. As far as the Romans are concerned, comparing a living foreign queen to a Roman goddess is really deeply uncool. And so the simmer starts to come to a boil as a cohort of men start to plot in secret to save the Republic from the man they see as a tyrant. Some of these men are Caesar's enemies and rivals, but some are men who love him, including one Marcus Brutus. As the descendant of that other Marcus Brutus who helped to end Rome's monarchy in the first place, he feels that it's his birthright to kill tyrants, which must be really awkward for Servilia. Does she know of the conspiracy to kill her longtime lover? 
Probably not, or I think she would try to stop it, even if she too has concerns about Caesar's motivations and plans. And I mean, he's just cast another woman's likeness in gold, so screw him. But Servilia is a pragmatic woman who's made opportunity where other, less calculating women may have stumbled. And I don't believe she's in on the plot. Caesar has given her and her son many honors. I wonder if she knew if she would have betrayed her son to Caesar. Imagine having to make the choice between the man you've long loved, your only son, and the fate of the Republic. Which choice is the right one? She's going to be heartbroken, no matter which way she goes. And so comes the Ides of March, when Caesar is stabbed some 23 times in the Senate building. Did he actually say, as Shakespeare has it, et tu, Brute? And you, Brutus? In horror at finding Servilius' son wielding a knife? I doubt it, but he must be pretty caught up by the betrayal. Pun intended. I have no doubt that Servilia is too. The conspirators march out into the streets, announcing what they've done. The tyrant's dead! They scream to all and sundry. Isn't that wonderful and exciting? The people do not find this wonderful or exciting. In fact, a lot of them are pissed. Before long, Caesar's loyal friends are calling for the conspirators' blood. For a while, there's a strained peace between the different camps, but Caesar's very public funeral turns the tide against them. Suddenly, Servilius' son is not a savior as he hoped for, but an enemy of Rome. Even so, Servilia doesn't turn her back on him. The conspirators meet at her house, where they try to decide what to do next. There's only one thing to do, and that's leave the city before anyone stabs them. Brutus spends a lot of his time skulking around country villas, playing sad music, and feeling sorry for himself while he tries to decide how to get back into Rome's good graces. And though she must be grieving for her lover and angry at her son for all he's done, she steps in to help. Cicero tells us that she co-chairs a meeting in 43 BCE where they discuss next steps. The Senate is tossing around the idea of throwing Brutus and his fellow conspirator, Cassius, who is married to one of Servilia's daughters, a bone. That bone comes in the form of a commission to facilitate Rome's grain supply. It would get them away from the city and improve their standing with the Roman people. A win-win for sure. Cicero, who's most definitely Team Brutus, thinks the whole thing is beneath the two men. He wants to tell Brutus so, but then he thinks, why bother? He follows his mother's advice, or rather her prayers. He wrote to a friend. Why should I interfere? It is decided that Brutus and Cassius will take the commission, but not the lowly part that says they should secure the grain supply. But how do they get that particular line item taken out of the senatorial decree before they vote on it? Enter Servilia. Hold my drink. I'm handling this. This one thing, more than anything else we know about her, suggests the potential breadth of her political sway. She's saying she can actually get a proposed bill changed before it goes to the vote, even though she's a woman with no political standing and the mother of Caesar's murderer. That she believes she can do such a thing, and that Cicero and the others also believe she can do it, is pretty telling and extremely impressive. If she could do this, what else has she accomplished that never made it into the history books? Brutus goes off, leaving his mother to be his eyes and ears back in Rome. She helps him finance and organize his attempts to redeem his reputation. She is his mouthpiece, always worrying and fighting for him, acting as a bridge between him and important members of the Senate. Cicero says she's highly capable and dynamic, and very worried for her son. I was requested by that prudent and careful lady, your mother, all of whose anxieties refer to you and are consumed in you, to come to her on 25 July. He writes to Brutus in 43. So of course I did it without delay. But it's all for naught. In the chaotic aftermath of Caesar's death, a new power threesome rises, forming what's called the Second Triumvirate. We'll go into this little three-way more later, but right now let's just say their number one goal, other than one-upping each other, is hunting down Caesar's murderers. Rome is forced to choose who to back, these powers who say they want to settle the Republic, or Caesar's assassins who say they just wanted to save it. Brutus and his posse raise forces and try to fight back, and I'm sure Servilia helps them where she can, but it's a losing battle. 
In 42 BCE, Brutus commits suicide rather than be captured at the Great Battle at Philippi. We can only imagine how she feels upon receiving his ashes through the ancient world post. The next 13 years in Rome are going to be rocky ones. Though the Senate and Assembly still meet and elections continue, the triumvirs are pretty much running the show. We'll talk about this more with our next lady, but let's just say here that a whole lot of heads are gonna roll, quite literally. Thousands of patricians are killed, including Cicero, who is both Brutus's friend and Servilia's. And yet Servilia is spared. Why? Perhaps it's because she was beloved by Caesar. More likely, it's because she's made sure she is in such a powerful position that no one would dare to offer. This says something about her, too, that in a time of bloodshed and daggers under togas, Servilia lives for many more years and, like Cornelia, dies a natural death. We know frustratingly little about Servilia. What was her relationship with Caesar like, really? How much power did she hold behind the scenes in Republican Rome? Who was this woman? Over time, when she's portrayed at all, she's been shown as a devious temptress and a manipulative schemer with only her own interests at heart. Because if there's one thing we know for sure, listeners, it's that a woman who wants power must be a monster. The ancient Romans certainly found it something to be afraid of. But there's one thing about Servilia that is, to me, crystal clear. In a time before empresses, before women had clear paths to power at the highest levels, this shrewd political dynamo not only influenced her world and some of the most influential men within it, but survived some of the bloodiest days that Rome ever saw. She won a lot and lost a lot, but at the end of it all, she still managed to come out more or less on top. Raising my wine glass to you, Servilia. Next time, we'll meet another badass Roman domina, one that shocked, horrified, and awed the men of Rome with her naked desire for power. She led gangs, burned down buildings, and raised armies. For a time, Fulvia was one of the most powerful people in ancient Rome. Get ready, because with the original nasty woman at the helm, our story's gonna get pretty wild. Until next time. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, share it with some friends, leave a review, or consider becoming a patron for exclusive bonus episodes, interviews, sneak peeks, and more. You can also support the show and get yourself some lovely artwork while you're at it by purchasing a lady-centric map, timeline, art print, or greeting card over at my Etsy merchandise shop. For a transcript of this episode, a list of my research sources, lots of images, and more, check out my website at theexplorespodcast.com. Come find me on Instagram and Facebook at The Explores Podcast and Twitter at The Explores Pod. The music you just enjoyed comes courtesy of Michael Levy. A special thanks to my lovely intern, Stephanie Foley, for her help getting this episode together. Thanks, too, to Paul Koblonski, a.k.a. Mr. Explores, for my logo and theme music, and to the following legends for their vocal stylings. Amy Kaufman as the classy Servilia. Phil Chevalier as our delightful Julius Caesar. Simon Donatris as Cato. Avery Downing as Plutarch. Sean from the podcast Stories of Your and Yours as Cicero. John Armstrong as our singing Roman and Brendan Cousins. Merriment! I scorn such vices, and so should you. You brazen hussy!